Good day, everyone. I am Dr. Joya Feancheta, and today we'll be discussing forensic evaluations. Let's start by asking, why do we do psychiatric forensic evaluations? The reason is that we want to assist the judicial system, meaning the court, in the legal decision-making process by providing relevant psychiatric clinical information. The client, therefore, is the court, not the person that we are evaluating. That is why we do not refer to those who we evaluate as patient, but rather as evaluee. And in this sense, it differs from a regular patient-doctor relationship. Now, does that mean that the evaluee has no rights? No. Evaluees still have the right to, con to informed consent, which means that they may also refuse. However, we also have to inform them that their refusal to be evaluated will be documented and that the court will be informed that they refuse. As with any other person, they also have the right to be treated if necessary. However, it is recommended that they have a separate evaluating psychiatrist and treating psychiatrist. This is to avoid any conflict in the therapeutic or treating role and in the evaluator role. When we treat someone as a patient, our primary goal is to help the patient. On the other hand, when we evaluate someone for forensic purposes, our goal is to evaluate for the court. So, what types of cases merit a forensic report? This will depend on what the court would like us to evaluate. This is why we often ask the court what specifically they need. Because in criminal and civil litigations, it may be to either assess psychopathology at the time of the crime or they want to, us to know if someone is faking symptoms to avoid prosecution. It may be to assess the evaluee's risk for violence to others or even self-harm. It may be to assess emotional damages claim or to evaluate if someone is fit to stand trial or to testify in court. And it also can be to assess other competencies, such as in annulment proceedings, in custody proceedings, in the competence to make a will, or for adoption. The court may also be refer referring to us to evaluate, treat, or to admit someone. And we also do DDE or drug dependency evaluations. So what is the process with regards to these forensic evaluations? So in our institution, first, our social services assign a resident as a forensic evaluator for possible and ongoing legal cases. Now, not all people coming in our institution who have a legal case will need a forensic report. However, they still need to be decked so that the evaluating psychiatrist may already gather information. So, for example, if you have patients with existing cases but no court-mandated admissions, they will be admitted and discharged as regular patients. That's why we refer to them still as patients. Thus, court order is not needed in those cases, but it will be based on the clinical judgment. For other cases, of course, we must inform the court first before we do any clinical decision, such as admitting the patient or discharging the patient. So for detainees admitted at IPBM with no court-mandated admission, they will be endorsed back to the referring party. So for example, to the police, care of our social services. So in cases wherein we have evaluators who are no longer affiliated in our institution, they will be redecked to the resident still in service at IPBM. In these cases, the court is informed of the reassignment of the case to another evaluator. Forensic evaluations are not a one-time thing. It may take several evaluations with the attending physician. Multiple sources are also needed, so it's not just the evaluee. But you can also have um, social case study reports. NPT, and other pertinent documents such as affidavit, blotter, um, other reports, etc. The full psychiatric report shall be sent to the court once the evaluation has been completed and checked by the forensic consultant. A forensic report is different from an ordinary medical certificate. 
A good report is one that avoids medical jargon, meaning we try to avoid terms which a non-medical person would not understand. So for example, we explain in that report what a manic episode is, what is schizophrenia, etc. The court does not always ask the psychiatrist to testify as expert witness for every report done. This is up to the court if they need clarifications regarding the evaluation sent. A copy of the forensic report, including any court communications, is provided in the chart of the patient and the social worker in charge. For drug dependency evaluation or DDE, this will be conducted by DDE licensed practitioners. DDE report will follow the DOH or DDB recommended format. Finally, SPMC has a legal team. So if there are any forensic concerns that are complicated, we can always consult our legal experts. So now let's proceed to correcting misconceptions or incorrect assumptions about forensic evaluations. The first misconception is that we can act as human lie detectors, and that is, of course, not true. We can only evaluate for inconsistencies, clarify some statements, and we can report those inconsistencies to the court. But remember, not all evaluees who say incorrect things or omit truths are necessarily malingering. It may be because of psychopathology, such as dementia, or a psychotic process. Malingering and a psychiatric diagnosis are not also mutually exclusive. What we mean by that is a person with a psychiatric disorder may exaggerate his or her symptoms, or also a person with the intention to deceive may also have a psychiatric condition. Another misconception is that we work with the attorney to convince the court to rule in their favor. We must remember that we have to remain objective. We have to check our own biases as well. For example, we may be too quick to judge an evaluee with a murder case or assume a therapeutic role for an alleged victim of rape. But we should always go back to the purpose of the evaluation which is to assist the court and not the lawyer, not the evaluee. Another misconception is that we are the last say in competence of the evaluee. First, let's define what competence means. Competence is determined on the basis of a person's ability to make sound judgment, to weigh, to reason, and to make reasonable decisions. Competence is actually task-specific and not general. Meaning, a person may be incompetent in one aspect, but competent in other tasks. We can give opinions to assist the court in matters of competence, but it is only the judge or it is only his or her ruling that confer converts that opinion into a finding. So let's go to another misconception, which is that those with behavioral, mental, or emotional conditions cannot stand trial or are not um, fit to go to court. We assess an evaluee's fitness to stand trial based on whether they have sufficient present ability to consult with a lawyer with a reasonable degree of rational understanding and whether they have a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings against them. Therefore, if the evaluee has the ability stated above, then they may still be deemed as fit to stand trial, no matter what their psychiatric diagnosis is. Another misconception is that an evaluation is final and does not change. This is not true. An evaluee's mental status may change depending on several factors, such as if they are already taking and responding to medications. This is why there is a need to regularly update our evaluations. Another misconception is that the psychiatrist is the only one that can be called in court as expert witness. We often receive what is called subpina duces tecum ad testificandum. And what this means is um, the duces tecum part is we are to produce documents. And ad testificandum part is to give testimony to the court. But it is not only the psychiatrist who can receive these kinds of subpina. 
other personnel such as our psychologists and the medical records, for example, may also be called on to assist the court. The psychiatrists may also recommend an evaluee to be referred to another specialist. For example, um, if you have someone presenting with behavioral changes after a stroke, they may be referred to a neurologist. Lastly, another misconception is that since evaluees are not bound by traditional doctor-patient relationship, that their information can be just shared with anyone. But this is incorrect. Just because the evaluee has waived the confidentiality of the report to be used for the court, it does not mean that we can share their information with just about anyone. We are still bound to keep the confidentiality in instances that does not concern the court. As evaluators, we still maintain our professional ethics and share only the information we gather to the court and or to the treating physician if it is necessary. And that is the end for this topic. Please do not forget to post any questions you may have and also to answer the post test. Thank you.